sounds like a bird owl to me. Well, let's go see what the Gilly Galoo says. See ya. Bird owls. Let's have a little chat about some bird owls. Love those guys. Bard owls are great. Here we have uh, our bard owl box uh, that we manufacture. This is a Hans bard owl box. Uh, we have this big long stick that goes out on the here that is fastened to the box so the owlets can pop out of here and go down the limb when they're getting a bit adventurous and getting ready to leave the nest and then they can come back and go back in the box. That was a nice little clean out on the side here. Uh, all very well done, all to spec, whole size nesting cavity and perch on the on the thing. Super important to up your success rate about barred owls. So we've had some requests over the last little while to talk more about barred owls. But the barred owl is really uh, like everything cycles in terms of numbers and what have you, but it's uh, one of our more common owls here in Ontario. Um, the uh, unique feature is the bars, of course, that's the barred part of the barred owl. Uh, you can see across the front there the, how the, the, on his breast the stroke the, goes down. Very difficult to distinct between male and female. Uh, one of the only owls with the brown eyes. See the big brown eyes that he has there? Uh, very unique uh, feature. All the round face to collect all the air and stuff uh, so the sound they can turn their head and collect all that sound because they often they hear their prey a little more often than they see it initially and then their sight is so so strong that they they see it even in the dark and, and can go and get it. The reason I had a unique experience uh, one time uh, few years ago now but we were up at our camp and we were just sitting quiet it was just at dusk and uh, we'd had supper her and I were the only ones there and we were just sitting there and uh, really not saying anything we we're just taking in the forest and uh, and everything and how beautiful it was there and this barred owl came right around the corner of the of the camper that we had there at the time and flew directly right in front of us and went up in a tree about 90, excuse me, about 20 feet away from us, just uh, about a 90 degree away from us. It was a fantastic experience and we got to sit there and enjoy it for probably two, three, four minutes. Uh, it looked all around and what have you. And one of the unique things that I wanted to, and wanted to emphasize about their hearing and their sight was that we were, uh, motionless of course because it was very very close to it. it was only like 20 or 30 feet away from us and my binoculars were down beside me I always keep binoculars with me and I went just ever so slowly to move down to grab the binoculars that instant that I moved that bard just swiveled his head around and like that he could hear it and he could see me. So very unique feature that they have. The other very unique feature that they have that I really like to talk about is that their uh, ability to fly soundless. So other birds you can think of say, so when you think about say a flock of uh, Canada geese go over top of you, all you hear is a whoosh, 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 whoosh from the wings. These guys make absolutely no sound. There's been a bunch of studies done on it where they've actually done it in a closed area and had them fly for prey and tried to measure their, uh, their sound from their wings and there wasn't any. But the other thing that they really wanted to do was try to determine how they were able to uh, navigate through the forest in the pitch black dark. And it's very, very unique in the way that they would turn their body and tuck their wings and fly through obstacles uh, um, with that, that keen sense of how to do it. And that's the thing that's unique about the animal world uh, as it relates to the human world, even though we're an animal in this, is that we're not taking advantage of our u unique opportunities and our unique abilities, I should say. And that's one of them. They have to be mindful of that kind of stuff. Um, they love to live around water, uh, marshes and what have you because they eat a quite a bit of crayfish and frogs and uh, snakes and what have you. So they love to live around that. Um, these boxes, if you ever put one up, uh, needs to be away from as much human contact as possible to up the success rate, uh, which is the important side, is uh, just upping the success rate. Just going to tip this up a little bit here. There we go. 
Uh, so we up the success rate by having it away from human contact so that they get and find the box. The other unique thing about uh, the barred owl and their nesting habits is that the same pair will reuse, reuse, reuse that box every year. Uh, I was just reading a thing not too long ago about a fellow uh, that had a, a nesting site, uh, I think it was a bird made nesting site, this one, instead of a box, where uh, one year red, uh, red-tailed red hawk used it, the next year the owl used it, and the next year the red-tailed hawk used it, and the next year the owl used it. So it was whoever got there first, I guess. Uh, but they will continue to use the same site. The other unique thing then is that when the main pair, so let's say you get an adult breeding pair that use this box, once that they, they uh, either die off or one gets injured or they leave or whatever, because they only, you know, the, their lifespan, uh, some of the offspring of that original pair will start to use that nesting cavity. So once you establish that nesting cavity, it's very, very unique in that the owls will continue to use it for years and years and years. Uh, and as I say, they love their marshes, they love their uh, deeper forests and stuff. Here's a bit of a range, uh, they're all over eastern uh, Eastern North America, as you can see, a little bit going out west there and into the western seaboard, but this is all on the east and all in our area and some of their area above. But there, our region is uh, is very prime for them, particularly because of all our forested areas and things that we have uh, around us here in eastern Ontario. It's very, very prime for that. Uh, they, you know, they they hunt at night and at day in the daytime. Uh, so it's not uncommon, particularly in uh, nesting season. One of the unique things about them as well is that they nest very, very early. So they, they start to look for nesting sites. When we talk to people about putting the boxes up, uh, it's something that you have to do sort of uh, uh, November, October, November into December because they're starting to, to search out nesting cavities about that time uh, because they start the nesting process and the mating process into December, into January, and then start with their young uh, in late February into March and they'll be having uh, outlets and beyond the nest at that time. So the male's job during that period of time is to do all the foraging for food. So he's a busy guy and he will definitely be all over the place night and day to look for food, particularly when the outlets are growing up. And they, they normally have two to three eggs, sometimes four. Um, and so if there's four chicks in there, they consume a pile of food. So he's gotta get lots of mice and moles and all that kind of stuff. And the, and the nice thing that's happened is that they have adapted themselves to particularly at nesting time in the spring, they've adapted themselves to hunt around bird feeders in people's backyards. So people see them sitting in the trees, they see them sitting on their fences and what have you at dusk and, and uh, things because the mice and what have you that are on the ground getting uh, the, food, the bird seed underneath the feeders, they, uh, they'll be after the, those mice. And in fact, my daughter had a unique situation where she had an owl pellet in a tray feeder that she had on one of her pool systems. Uh, we actually took it apart and found the mouse jaws and uh, hair and little bones and their tiny teeth and all kinds of things. So it was a very, very cool thing. So they adapt quite a bit like everybody else. They're very adaptive, They, particularly when they're foraging for food. Um, the, the, the courtship part of things is such that the male and the female will sort of make a ritual that they bob their heads and make a little bit of noise and stuff. And one of the uh, calls that I wanted to play for you, uh, when, when they're, they are together, the, they call it uh, their hoo <laughs> I think they sound like monkeys, but check this out. Hear the pair? Well, the second will hoot here. <laughs> so when you get them nesting around you, you gotta be ready for that because that's a pretty cool thing. Uh, the other uh, the other unique feature, and the one that we saw that flew in front of us, Louise and I, when we were up at the camp, we realized it was a young one because it started squealing for food. And then another uh, couple of owls came along, I assume it was the parents at that time. Uh, and if you ever hear the squeal of the, of the young owl, the fledged owl, it, you think somebody was being uh, harmed in a bad way. Check this out. All set for Halloween. 
be an owl for Halloween. There you go. That'll fix you up. Hoo, hoo, hoo. I have my granddaughter saying that, actually. That's the funniest thing. Uh, Lila, my granddaughter, her and I will do, hoo, hoo, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you? <laughs> so Lila will do that back and forth with me. So, barred owl, beautiful bird. The female is often larger than the male uh, in a lot of these raptors. They love their uh, wetlands, they love their hardwood forests and what have you. Check out bottoms of trees and stuff so you can find some owl pellets and then you'll know that they're roosting up above it before you. Put up and create some habitat if you can and if you are interested in and uh, enjoy the barred owl. Come see us soon. Thanks for stopping by. <laughs> Have a good day. Three.